Amen, amen. Thank you. Go ahead and be seated. Man, it is great to see all of you here. Thank you for coming today. It is Before we get started, it's time for our kindergarten, first and second graders. If you will go ahead, and Miss Carrie is in the back waiting on you. Kindergarten, first and second grade, if you would, go ahead and head on back. Um, Brother Patrick, could you hand me my clicker right there? I can't preach without that thing. Thank you, sir. So we'll see all you little ones back here in just a little bit. Any more kindergarten, first and second graders want to uh, head back? You're free to go. So thank you for uh, uh, being here with us today. Want to again welcome all of you. Thank you for coming, all you at home. Thank you. And I want to just share very quickly, very personal thing here. Thank you for all of you that have been praying for uh, my family and myself. As uh, as many of you know, my sister passed away. Uh, last Thursday morning, and uh, I went back today or this weekend and did a uh, did the service for her. And uh, so, just continue to pray for us. Pray for my my niece and her family and my nephew as they go through this holiday season uh, with this loss. But the thank you for continually praying for us, and and we appreciate it very much. Want to take just a moment and embarrass somebody, Brother Ken and Beth Lane are here. Brother Ken, pastor at Olivet Baptist Church. He's it's great to have you both here with us today and visiting, and I guess you got to almost come home, right? You, you were here a long time ago, if I'm not mistaken, so it's good to have them here. And also in the back there, uh, Jacob Brand is back with us from Korea, and uh, he's been serving in the military over there, so Jacob, good to have you home. I know mom came, came across the parking lot just glowing, having, having baby boy back home with her. And I want you to know in the first service... Uh, we had Joseph uh, Kelly here, Cadet Kelly from West Point. He was back, and they're going to be here with us again next week. So, man, uh, First Baptist West is represented all around the world now. Amen? So uh, it is good to have them home. And uh, I, I do get a little nervous. I told Brother Ken I get nervous when pastors are in the uh, congregation with Brother Wes and, and, and he are both here. And I get a little nervous because preachers... Uh, get, get a little nervous preaching in front of them. So uh, guys, just hang on and I'll do my best, all right? <laughs> but thank you both for what you do as well. Today we're going to be looking at the fourth advent of uh, uh, a Sunday Advent is love. And the idea of this, this, this thing with love is the fact that uh, we're going to be looking today again at divine love. Randy, it's not clicking for me. If you can switch that over for me, I'd appreciate it. There we go. Now it's gone a couple ahead, but that's all right. Today we're looking at divine love or perfect love, which is the character of God. This, this idea of perfect love, we want to look in 1 John chapter 4, starting at verse 17. So I want you to take your Bibles there, and Stacy read just a little bit of that this morning as, she, as we were lighting the candle. But I want to read the whole text there uh, with the idea of what we're dealing with on this idea of perfect love. It, it's, it's the word that is agape, and it refers to a benevolent charitable love and we're going to be looking at that definition in just a moment but it's divine love and as I've shared with you all the the, the four sermons that I've given they're not, it's all divine because the idea of joy love peace hope those are not good when they're in the worldly sense but when they're in divine love now we're talking about it now we're talking about it being from God and being uh, pure and being honest but also being lasting So let's go ahead and stand in reading of 1 John chapter 4, starting at verse 17. And it says here, Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in the world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you, and and God, we thank you for what you've done. We thank you, Lord, for who you are and how you love us, and and God, how that can be perfected for us, and that we can have this idea of of this divine, agape, sacrificing love that that you've given to us. Lord, that we can then be confident in these things and no longer fear. And God, we live in a society that is fearful now. We have so much going on that we're not sure of. But Father, we rest in you today. And Father, I pray that the the words I'm about to say will not be my words, but yours. I pray, Father, that this will not be a message that I put together, but Lord, that you you planned. And that, Father, the response will be from your people as you desire for it to be. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. 
Amen. God bless you. Thank you. Be seated. So the idea of perfect love, I, I, I put the definition up for you because the perfect love, and it refers to, a, again, a benevolent and charitable love that seeks the best for the loved one. So when John is writing, when, when we're writing here, it says that this, this love has been perfected in you, this agape perfect love. It's a self-sacrificing love. It's not like the love of the world. Now, the English language is kind of a crazy language. We use words for stuff that, for a wide variety of things. Just for example, the idea of love is, is, can be used from way out stuff. Man, to I love ice cream. I love my family. I love this. I love that. But the idea here is that it's the agape love. It's that not selfish love. It's not that I do it so that I can get something brought back to me in return. But it's a love that is given out from God to us with no conditions. It's unconditional love. And the world love to many uh, is, is a good thing. But folks, listen. The world love doesn't usually hold up really well, amen? Worldly love can come here and be gone tomorrow. But this idea of agape love, this perfect love that God formed in us, testing his, showing his character is one that is forever and eternal. And so what I want to look at today is the idea about this fear and about the perfect love. Because it says here, love has been perfected among us and that we have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect fear casts out, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. So what I want to look at today is this idea of, of fear. The idea of fear is basically the, that fear comes from the uncertainty that sin brings. That when I'm talking about this, it's the idea of the uncertainty that sin brings into our lives. We don't know what's going on, and so that brings a fear to us. Now, I want to look at the contrast of, of fear and basically, if you will, uh, the lack of sin. Because if you look and remember in the book of, of Genesis in the garden... Adam and Eve, the Bible says, had perfect fellowship with God. And so what they would do is on a regular basis, daily basis, all the time, they would walk in the garden and the Almighty God, the Creator, uh, the, the Creator God would walk with them and they had fellowship with God. As, as we have a fellowship with the Spirit, man, they had fellowship with God the Father. And at that time, they could even look upon God and see God and everything was good. And man, I can imagine every single day they woke up and said, man, I can't wait until I get to be in fellowship with God. I can't wait till I see him and we talk and we walk in the garden and have a great time. But then we look at the contrast. Because in the book of Genesis chapter 3, when Adam and Eve, and we look in the Genesis chapter 3, 8, verses 8 and 9, we see that, that Adam and Eve sinned. And the Bible says immediately their eyes were opened and they realized that they, they were naked and they were ashamed. Now, this day was about to be different than any other day before because the Bible says that when God came to walking in the midst of the garden, that Adam and Eve, instead of running to God, wanting to see God and have fellowship with God and be with Him just right up close, the Bible says instead of doing that, what did they do? They ran away from God. They were afraid of God. What changed? It was the uncertainty of sin in their lives. Sin had been brought into them, and now they were uncertain how God was going to deal with them. They were uncertain of how they were going to deal with God, and they knew that there was something going to be completely different. And so the uncertainty of sin made a contrast for those two people who were just the day before having perfect fellowship with God, who longed for God, ran after God looking for Him, couldn't wait for Him to come to the garden, now all of a sudden we see that they were running away from him. Look what sin can bring. And this idea of perfect love casts out that fear. So we're talking about the, 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 the uncertainty of sin is no longer there. Because, my friends, I want to tell you there's nothing quite like fear in the human heart. Fear can cause some amazing things in us. And God doesn't want us to have this fear, and especially in 2020, as we get ready to wrap things up from this year, and we don't know what's coming next year. I know a lot of people are thinking, man, just, just get us out of 2020 and 21. It's going to be a brand new year. Woo! Things are going to be different. Can I tell you, we don't know that. Because the first day of January 2021, 
might just be like the last day of 2020. Amen? As a matter of fact, chances are that's how it's going to be. But this is the uncertainty, and so it brings about a fear, and there's nothing quite like fear in the human heart. Because here's what happens. The Bible tells us here in this text that the uncertainty of sin creates torment, which is suffering. It's a torment, which is suffering. It's, it's the idea of bringing anguish to the soul, being a, bring anxiety and unsettledness. My friends, listen to me. We are living in anxious times today. Man, people are full of anxiety and anguish, and people are so unsettled. They're running from one thing to the next, trying to find something that's going to bring that peace to them, that happiness to them, that bring a calmness to their spirit. But we see here that it's not capable because this is what fear does. It says that fear of judgment is, is the torment. It involves torment. So anytime we have fearful, fearfulness in us, there's torment. And that's why the Bible says, fear not. Don't be afraid. Even in today, folks, don't be so afraid because all it's going to do is bring anguish to us. Anxiety is, uh, anxiety is as high as I've ever seen it in our nation. Again, unsettledness. But not only is the, does it cause torment, but it also can cause anguish. Now we look and we see here, it's the faltering. It brings faltering, which is paralyzed. The first response to, to something fearful is that we, we stop. We're running and all of a sudden something jumps out at us and we stop. Now, immediately after that, we might respond with, fighting or kicking or a scream like a girl or whatever but the first initial response is we freeze we we pause we become paralyzed that's why we we talk about we we heard that phrase being paralyzed with fear folks do you realize that's real that you can become so fearful you don't do anything you don't move you just you just stop can i tell you this is why satan wants christian individuals to be fearful because he doesn't want us moving forward this is why he wants christian families to be fearful of what's going on around them because he doesn't want them moving forward that's why he wants the church to be fearful because he wants us to be paralyzed that we won't move forward what we'll do is we'll just suck it up tight we'll pull in close together we'll surround each other and that's all we're going to do we're just going to try and and survive this is the idea of fear is that it brings about a faltering to us and why is that because it's due to judgment it's due to judgment can I tell you this and all you at home listen to me we talk about in this year of how how this time of season how God is is merciful and God is gracious and God is all these things but can I tell you that there is something called judgment and judgment my friends is real there is a real judgment. Judgment is coming, and it comes to individuals. It comes to nations. It comes to groups of people. As a matter of fact, the Bible describes two types of judgments, two times of judgments. One is the great white throne judgment. That's where the Bible says in the book of Revelation, in the great and small, all the people stood before God, and they, there were books that were open, and they were, those were the books of life. That's going to be the opportunity for those folks who may be sitting here, or you may be at home, that you're, li you're watching this, and you say, well, I reject the idea of Christ. I'm going to try to get to heaven on my own. I'm trying to be a good boy, a good girl, a good individual, and so I'm going to trust that when I stand before God, all of my good things are going to outweigh my bad things and he's going to let me in well listen to me the great white throne judgment is just for that but here's the deal that when you do that and you stand before God it's not that your good outweighs your bad it's that your goodness is as good as God that's why the books are there to testify out your life and say did you did you hold up to the idea of God were you perfect like him that's why the Bible says for all have sinned and fallen short of what the glory of God, which means you cannot reach God. But listen, you want to try it? He's going to let you. If you're at home today and you want to test your goodness, God's going to let you. But there's going to be a great white throne judgment. And at that moment, your, righteous better be, your righteousness better be as good as God's. And you say, well, wait, pastor. That's not fair, is it? Sure it is. But here's the cool thing. He sent Jesus to die on the cross for us that we could receive his righteousness which makes us there 
equal, equal with God. Not in our abilities and all that, but our righteousness. Because it's no longer my righteousness. Praise God, it's not my righteousness. Because my righteousness, the best I can do before God is as filthy rags. Oh, but when I become His righteousness, He becomes my sin, I become His righteousness, now... I don't have to stand before God in this great white throne judgment. So if you're here today and you have Jesus, you don't have to fear that judgment. That's part of it. Now, there's also the second fear. And just very quickly, I I won't preach much on that one. But on the second one is is what we call the Bema Seat of Christ or the Judgment Seat of Christ. That's where those of us who are believers will still stand before Jesus. And the Bible says to give an account for those things that we did in this life, whether good or bad. So I'm going to have to stand before Jesus and hand him all my stuff and say, here's what I did for you. Now, that's not going to be whether I get to go to heaven or not. That's sealed. Amen. But I'm going to have to stand before Jesus who died for me and say, here's what I did. Sometimes in my life, there's things I don't want to hand over to him. But that's the judgment. So judgment's coming. And I believe with all my heart that everyone knows something is coming. If you don't rationalize it out, or you don't uh, make, make any preconceived ideas, I believe every individual who's walking this earth or who has ever walked this earth, if they would pause for just a moment, just for a second, they would understand this is real. And I think that's why there's so much unsettledness and hate in this world. So we look and we see that fear comes from uncertainty that sin brings. But the second point that I want to look at is this, is the idea that, that, that there is the, this perfect love brings about a boldness to us. There's a boldness to all of us if we have Christ in our lives. Guys, can you move that forward to me? It's not, it's not working. If we move forward, we, we see then that there is a boldness and perfect love brings about a boldness. Because why? Because of an assurance. There is an assurance in us. If we have Jesus in our lives, there is an assurance there that we need to have. And we have it because of a couple of things. One is this. We have an assurance, first of all, because of his acceptance. His acceptance in us. We we are accepted from God. Every person has an open spot in their souls, I believe with all my heart, that desires and longs to be accepted. Amen? I mean, whether you're a young child where you're uh, in in school, because that's one of the things that brings about a whole lot of anxiety in young people, is that they feel like they're being rejected by their peers. We all want to be accepted, and that doesn't go away when we're adults. We all want to be liked, amen? We want to know that people accept us. We want to know that we're a part of a group and, and things are good. Every person has that, and we need to understand that he loved us first. He loved us first, folks. Praise God, and I can, I can have that assurance because he accepts me, and it's unconditional. Look what it says verse 19. We love him because he lo- first loved us. I love him not because of what I've done, but because he loved me unconditionally. I don't have to build up myself. I don't have to do better things. I don't have to get really good at stuff for God to love me. God loves me, and here's the cool thing. He accepts me as I am we used to sing that song in church all the time amen just as I am that's how God wants us to come to him he doesn't want us to get better he doesn't want us to live a good life and then come to him he says I will take you right now where you are because I love you and my love is unconditional the Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 16 it says, let us there come, therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we, he, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Listen, my friends, we, God wants us to come boldly to the throne. Now, this boldly doesn't mean that we come with cockiness. Say, "Woo, God, aren't you lucky that I'm coming to you now? Aren't you so blessed? I am God's gift to the world. Thank you, God, that you made me who I am. And now I can come to you and, boy, God, you're lucky to have me. That's not the boldness it's talking about. That boldness, come boldly to the throne of grace, says that when I am in need, I know that I can go to God. I don't have to worry about what I've done, where I've been, what, what, what all the dirtiness in me. That when I need God, I come boldly to the throne knowing that he will accept me as I am in my life. And he will not push me away when I come to him and say, 
God, I need you in my life. God, I'm lost and I'm a sinner. I need to come to you. He says, I will bring you in. Come boldly, knowing that I love you, knowing that I, I want you, knowing that I long for you to be here. Come boldly to the throne. So we have a boldness or a confidence that God has accepted us. There's something good about that, amen? The second thing on that is to know that we have assurance in His provision. Because of His provision, because of the things that He's done, Jesus has met our needs. How do we know that? How do we know that God is willing to meet our needs? Well, the verse of Scripture that I want you to look at is in Romans 8.32. Romans 8.32 asks this question. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? He said, look, you needed Jesus and he, he gave them. He gave him to you. He gave his own son to you. What makes you think that if he is willing to give his son to you, that there's anything else to hold back? There is nothing else to hold back from God, that God has to hold back from us because He has already given us everything. So if He's willing to give us His Son, what in the world makes me think He won't be able to work with me? He wants to take care of us. And I have that confidence that no matter what is going on, God is there and that God will meet my needs. And He has met my needs through Jesus Christ. And the thing I want you to understand is He brings contentment in our provisions. When he provides for us, he brings a contentment. Paul said that I have learned to have plenty and be okay with that. And I've learned to have little and be okay with that. How can you do that? How in the world can you learn to be, as the, the, uh, the King James says, learn to abase and be abound and abound? Be abased and abound. How, how can you be content with that? When God has met your needs and you realize it and you have confidence in Him, my friend, that's how you're able to do that. So He has met our needs. He has not held back His only begotten Son for us. So not only do we have His acceptance and not only do we have His provision and the contentment of His provision, but the third thing is we have His presence. That we have confidence and assurance in His presence. Here the Bible says that God gives us rest. The Bible talks about giving us rest. Now, that rest is not days off. We, we all think, whew, all right, I got, I got some days off. That's my rest. That's not what he's talking about. It's talking about that he gives us a peace. He gives us an, a, a calmness because where his presence is, that's where peace is. Exodus 33 verse 14 says this. And he said, my presence will go with you And I will give you rest. What is this rest? Again, it's that peace. He gives us that rest and where we can calm down and that we know everything is going to be okay. That I can breathe. God, thank you for your provision. But not only does he give us rest, but he gives us protection. That's the next thing we get from that is we get God's protection. Man, that's pretty cool. The most mighty being ever, ever. They're the creator of all the world, the giver and sustainer of life. He is protecting me. He has put a shield around us that Satan cannot penetrate us. He cannot take us away from him. The Bible tells us in Psalm 31, 20, says, You shall hide them in the secret place of your presence from the plots of man. So the, my question is, is, is also asked in the Bible, what do I have to fear? What can man do to me? What can man do to me? It can't. Because it says here that you shall hide them in the secret place of your presence. So where God is, and that's where I am, I am protected that men can't do anything to me. But it also says this, you shall keep them secretly and in pavilion from the strife of tongues. What does it matter what they say about me? As long as I... Know that I am in God's presence. Doesn't matter what men do to me. Doesn't matter what men say about me. As a matter of fact, we're, we're encouraged many times, do not fear men who can't do anything to you. As a matter of fact, the worst it says they can do to you is kill you. Now that brings fear to many people. Oh, well, kill me. Well, Paul says, though, to be absent from the body, to be present with the Lord. So what can they really do to us? And when I have that confidence, when I have that assurance, man, we walk into a place a whole lot different than when we, if we walked in fearful. 
I remember times in all those years that I was coaching, and I'm telling you, God blessed me over those years. I don't know why, but he blessed me with some amazing athletes to coach. Amazing girls, man. And there were many years we had lots of good teams, and, and it was really I, I could tell when we walked into the gym. And a lot of times we would walk into the gym, and men, again, we had the athletes. And I could walk in, we'd walk into the gym, and the girls would be walking to the locker room. I could see the other team. And I knew that when the other team stopped shooting and began to watch us, you know what I thought in my mind? We got a good chance tonight already. We're already up. Because we were walking in with confidence. They looked at us and said, oh my. We've, we've heard about them. And folks, listen to me. There's difference to walk in someplace with confidence than with fear. When we walk into year 2021, can I tell you this, folks, you at home, listen. I want to tell you we can walk into the, this, this next year, 2021, with confidence. Oh, we can't walk in with confidence that everything's going to go my way. Can't do that, but I can walk in with confidence knowing that God has prepared the way for me. And he's prepared me for the way. He has gone before us, his presence. As a matter of fact, the Bible has even said, God, if we go and your presence isn't there, we don't want to go. I don't want to go into 2021 if God's presence isn't there. I don't want to go in the next hour if God's presence isn't there. Because it gives us a confidence. A confidence. And the last thing, very quickly, the third one is, we love as a result of his loving us. We love, we're able, it says that love has been perfected among us in that we may be, have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, so are we in this world. As, we, as he is, so are we in this world. What that means is, my friends, brothers and sisters, you here and you at home, people should see that perfect love through us. Because it's been perfected and just as he is in this world, Guess what? That's what he expects from us. He expects us to love. How are we able to love like that? How am I able to give that self-sacrificing love over to people outside who have no care about me, have no care about about anything that I'm involved in? How can we do it? Because, again, we are no longer fearful of uncertain things in our lives because God has taken care of the sin of our lives. We know that we have an assurance that they can't do anything to us anyway, so we need to go out there and love them. The Bible tells us in 1 John 3, 18. It says, my little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but listen, let us love in deed and truth. Don't just talk. Don't just say it. Prove it. Do what you're saying. The Bible is very clear. It says, if someone is hungry... Do not walk up to them and say, be filled and I'm going to pray for you. And I, I'm going to pray God will pour out blessings of food on you, but we'll talk to you later and turn around and leave. It says that if we see a person that is hungry, now go ahead, please pray for them. Amen? Pray for them. Pray that God will meet their needs. But do you know what we're supposed to do first? Feed them. Show your love in deed and truth, not just in words. Because it's easy to say, I love you. And it's easy, listen, it's easy to even say, I'll pray for you. That's easy. Now, I'm not going to ask you to confess because I'm going to be the one confessing. You know, there have been times in my life that I'd tell someone I'd pray for them. And then I'd get busy. And you know what I would do? I'd forget to pray for them. So it's easy to say. But it's not so much just to say you'll pray for them. So that's why now, whenever I'm out somewhere, or even on the phone, with someone says, hey, would you pray for me? You know what I ask them right then? I try right then to do. Can I pray for you now? You know why? Because it's guaranteed I prayed for them. Because it's a sin to say I'll pray for you and not pray for them. But listen, so pray for them. But it says, love them in deed and truth. Show it. So my friends, listen to me. Today we can have confidence in this thing called the world. Not because of us and not because of the world. Not because of the stability of the world. We have it because of the stability of God through Jesus Christ. We have that today.
But if you're here this morning, or you're watching here today, I want you to understand, you do not have this love working in you apart from Jesus Christ. So you need Jesus in your life today. And I want to ask you, do you know Jesus is your Savior? Not how have you been to church, not are you being baptized, not are you watching services every Sunday, not are you trying to be a good boy or good girl. Do you know Jesus? Has there been that point in your life that you said, God, I know that I need you, and I know I'm lost without you, and I, I ask that you, you forgive me of my sin through the blood of Jesus. Save me today. You can say that with confidence, knowing that he loves you unconditionally, and that he'll do that. But maybe you're here and you say, Pastor, I know I'm saved, but man, I've had a lot of anxiety, I've had a lot of fear, I've had a lot of struggles this year. And all I can tell you is, man, God still loves you and he wants to help you through this. He wants to give you a confidence that you may not have had in a long time. But it comes through you renewing your commitment to him. You're renewing your heart to him, saying, God, forgive me. I know that I've gotten caught up in the craziness of this world. And Lord, it's brought fear to my heart. It's brought torment to me. It's brought faltering to me. And God, I just pray today that you'd renew the joy of your salvation in my life, God. Give me that confidence that I know, God, that you have and you can bring to us. Because I want that perfect love to cast out any fear that I might have. Because I know, God, you love me. Would you do that today? And then let's move forward, church. Let's go on. Let's look forward to 2021 knowing that God is there. God is going to work. God is going to continue to keep his promises to us. No matter what comes our way, know that God's going to keep his promise. I'd like you to bow your heads as we step into this time of invitation. If you're here or you're watching and you don't know Jesus, here's your opportunity to turn to him today. Very simple, but it's something you must do. You must be born again. So I want to encourage you today. Would you call upon the name of the Lord? I'll be down front ready to pray with you. If you're at home and you need someone to pray with, just call our church, 536-4227. Someone will be on the line to pray with you. Would you do that? Or if you're here and you say, or you're there at home and say, I know I'm saved, but pastor, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid. And let me pray over you real quick. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that you would cast out the fear of anyone in this room, anyone watching this program. Father, by your power and your blood, by, give them confidence, Lord, of your presence, of your power, and your acceptance. God, do it today. Let us be renewed in Jesus' name. My friend, Kaylee's going.